Hello, my name is Dr. Teresa Bacon Bagley, and I am a professor in the College of Health Professions at Grand Valley State University. Today we're going to talk about the cells of the brain, which are the neurons and the glial cells. And I'd also like to mention that the reason why we're looking at the cells and the structure and function of the brain is to get a better understanding of what happens during a concussion, which we will get to in a few modules. The goals of this unit are to be able to list the cells of the brain, describe how neurons in the brain communicate, and to describe the role of neurotransmitters in neuron communication. There are two major types of cells in the brain. There are the neurons and the glial cells. The neurons process information. They communicate one with another. They are very important in our ability to contract our muscles, to be able to feel our sensory input. Some individuals call the neurons the functional cells within the brain. We also have glial cells. Glial cells are supportive cells. They allow the neurons to communicate. There are many types of glial cells, and each type has a different or a very discreet function. It should be noted also that neurons do not have the ability to divide. So once you destroy a neuron, you cannot replace it through cell division because neurons don't have the ability to undergo cell division. Glial cells, however, do. They do have the ability to undergo cell division and replace cells that have died. There are four major types of glial cells, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, microglial cells, and ependymal cells. The astrocytes are named for the Greek word astro because they look like a star, and that's what astro means, is star. So you can see by this picture that they look like these very bright green stars on the left-hand side of the slide. And then they're diagrammed on the right side with having star-like characteristics. Astrocytes surround our blood vessels in the brain. This makes it difficult for viruses and bacteria to get into the brain tissue. They would have to travel all the way through those astrocytes in order to get to brain tissue. Astrocytes also store nutrients for neurons. They can store ions, potassium, they can store neurotransmitters, as well as other nutrients for neurons to function. Another type of glial cell is the oligodendrocyte. The oligodendrocyte is a cell that covers the axon of a neuron. The axon of a neuron is usually long and travels a long distance. So the oligodendrocyte, as seen on your right-hand side, sends out part of its cell structure and wraps it right around the axon. So it covers the axons of neurons in the brain and the spinal cord. It creates somewhat of an insulation around the axon, and that insulation is referred to as myelin. That myelin protects the axon as well as allows for that axon to transmit information quickly. Oligodendrocytes are extremely important in the functioning of the neuron. Microglial cells, another type of glial cell, is similar to a type of white blood cell in the blood. It's actually very similar to a phagocytic cell, such as a neutrophil or a macrophage. These microglial cells recognize foreign substances and actually engulf the foreign substance and try to destroy it. They're very important against infectious agents getting into the brain. So meanwhile, when there is no infection, these cells just kind of exist in the brain. They just travel around in between the neurons. And eventually, if there should be some type of infectious agent, they become activated and they engulf and destroy whatever is seen as foreign within the brain. The ependymal cell is the last type of glial cell that we're gonna talk about. It is present in areas of the brain where cerebral spinal fluid is made. Those areas are referred to as the ventricles. We have 
a lateral ventricle, then we have a third ventricle and a fourth ventricle. They are spaces within the brain where cerebral spinal fluid is made. Therefore, they play a role in the production of that fluid. The neurons have a very unique structure. They have three major components to their cell structure. They have a cell body. The cell body is where we have the genetic information for a neuron. Uh, we have proteins that are being produced. It is kind of the center of where everything happens in the neuron. However, the cell body needs to receive information from other neurons, and it needs to transmit information to other neurons. Therefore, the cell body has appendages called dendrites. Most neurons have many dendrites. The purpose of the dendrites is that they receive information from other neurons. So the information comes to the dendrites, and that information is conveyed to the cell body. Now the cell needs to process that information it just received, and then it needs to communicate with the next neuron. And it does so through, through a long, slender structure referred to as the axon. The axon conducts or carries information to other neurons as well as to other organs. At the end of the axon, you have the axon terminal. It's at the axon terminal that a substance is released that binds to the next neuron and allows for communication to occur. So it's at the axon terminal where information is transmitted from one neuron to another. Now, I briefly touched a little bit on the function of neurons, but the function of a neuron really is to create what we call is an action potential. An action potential is an electrical signal that travels down the axon. It's between another neuron. When an action potential travels down the axon, it results in the release of a chemical substance at the axon terminal. A chemical substance, when it's released, will bind to a receptor on the second neuron, and that is the mechanism by which neurons communicate. So in order to communicate, you really need two neurons, a chemical substance released from one neuron, a receptor for that neurochemical substance to bind to. That junction between the axon terminal and the second neuron is referred to as a synapse. So that really is the whole area by which two neurons are connected. Again, it requires the two neurons, it requires that chemical substance which is referred to as a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter is a chemical signal used to communicate between the two neurons. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, you also need something for that neurotransmitter to bind to, which is referred to as a receptor. You can see from the right-hand side of this slide that you have the end of the axon in pink. You have these little orange balls being released, which are the neurotransmitter and you have those neurotransmitter balls binding to the receptor on the second neuron. Now, neurotransmitters. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the neurotransmitters or the neurochemicals that allow neurons to communicate. When someone suffers a concussion, there is no structural damage. In other words, neurons don't die, there isn't bleeding into the brain. It's really a functional problem. And one of the theories behind a concussion is that there's a change in the neurotransmitters or a change in the receptors that allow for parts of the brain not to function as it should. So we're going to talk about some of those neurotransmitters that may or may not have something to do with functioning after a concussion. Acetylcholine is one of the neurotransmitters. It's referred to as an excitable neurotransmitter because generally when it binds to its receptor, it makes cells more excitable. 
There are some disorders that are associated with uh, acetylcholine deficits. Now there is one of the theories for Alzheimer's that has to do with a reduced synthesis of acetylcholine. There have also been studies in the literature that have linked a deficit of acetylcholine to memory issues, the inability to remember things. GABA stands for a very long name referred to gamma amino butyric acid. It's a neurotransmitter that tends to make neurons less excitable when it binds to its receptors. Medications that increase GABA levels in the brain have been used to treat seizures as well as tremors. Now, one of the theories with seizures is that neurons are more excitable and therefore seizure activity occurs. GABA-like stimulation would make neurons less excitable and therefore would decrease the incidence of seizures. Another neurotransmitter is serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that is involved in behavior, it is involved in mood, appetite, as well as pain. Medications that cause the brain's level of serotonin to increase have been used to treat depression. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's involved in mood and the control of muscle movement. A loss of dopamine in some parts of the brain can lead to Parkinson's disease. In other parts of the brain, it can lead to depression. And in even different parts of the brain, it actually can lead to psychosis or overexcitability. How can neurons dysfunction, resulting in problems with brain function? You can have a loss of neurons, meaning that they die off, either spontaneously or through a severe brain injury or a moderate brain injury. You can also have neuronal malfunction through a loss of myelin. If you lose that myelin sheath on the axon, then the transmission of the action potentials is not as quick as what it should be. You can also have neuronal malfunctioning based on a loss of neurotransmitters. Therefore, a neuron cannot communicate correctly with the second neuron. Let me give you a couple examples of how you can have neuronal uh, disorders with some specific diseases. With loss of neurons, a stroke is a very good example of this. When people have a stroke or cerebral vascular accident, they end up having death of part of the brain tissue. So part of the brain tissue actually dies, and based on the part of the tissue that dies will result in specific manifestations. We learned a few modules ago that the motor cortex is in part of the frontal lobe. If the stroke occurred over the motor cortex, then that patient would have difficulty with using their muscles. Another type of disorder that involves a loss of myelin is multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, the cells that produce the myelin, if you remember, those are the oligodendrocytes, they actually die off. This is not associated with traumatic brain injury. Multiple sclerosis is thought to be an autoimmune disorder where the body just, for no reason at all, destroys its myelin, and that results in neuronal malfunction. Depending on where the myelin is lost will depend on the manifestations. Again, going back to that structure function relationship. There are a variety of disorders that are associated with either a loss of neurotransmitters or some disorders have too much of the neurotransmitter. Depression is thought to be due to a deficiency of either serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine. Depression could be due to either a decrease in one of those or it could be all three of those. Therefore, medications that treat depression are aimed at increasing the amount of those neurotransmitters. Now again, remember that in a concussion really does not involve a loss of neurons because there is no structural change. In addition, in a concussion there is no loss of myelin, there is no death of oligodendrocytes. However, there is some theories that in a concussion 
there's an alteration in either the neurotransmitters or the receptors, and therefore communication between neurons is altered. This is the end of the module on the cells of the brain, which are the neurons and the glial cells. Thank you.